You can open this presentation yourself and follow along with the examples on your own laptop. Or after this presentation, you can go home and try it out yourself. So for this presentation, I'll introduce myself and the Google Maps API. I'll show you some examples. And then we'll step through code. Because the API is all about writing little bits of JavaScript and seeing it do cool things. So that's what we're going to do. So here are some examples of sites uh, that other people have made that are very popular. These are some of my favorite API sites. This first one is a subway map of New York City. And the reason this is so useful is because we haven't added the New York subway to our regular Google map. You know, maybe we have some people working on it. Maybe we'll release it next month. But because we have the API, it's possible for you, the outside developers, to go and create it yourself. So someone has done that here. And you can see they have basically your regular Google map tiles. And they've added all of these subway lines. Now, a second example of an API site that I want to show you is Trulia. And this is a common kind of site uh, in the sense that we have a lot of real estate sites. And this is sort of your classic mashup, right? Because real estate, location, location, location. Anything with location is going to be very useful to put in a mashup, where you can combine one type of information that's specific to a geographic latitude, longitude, and connect that to something you can see on a map. So here, I'm looking at different real estate options for San Jose area. And you could imagine this same data being available you know, in your newspaper, in classifieds, or text advertisements. But being able to see it on a map is important because people care about where. The third example of an API site I want to show you is Panoramio. And in Pan Panoramio, this allows users to upload their photos and tag them with a specific geographic location. And now I can browse around on a map and find photos for that location. And again, photos are useful, maps are useful, but mashing them together creates something more than the sum of those two. The last example API site I want to show you is called Wikimapia. Now, Wikimapia is a little bit different from many of the API sites I first saw. For example, it's different from the subway. Basically, it has all of these rectangles. And when I first saw it, I think this was toward the end of last summer, you know, it jumped to the top of our list of most popular API sites. And I went on here and looked, and I couldn't tell why it was useful. I thought, what are all these rectangles? A bunch of rectangles on the page. OK, wiki. So it's created by users. Anyone who wants to can come and draw a rectangle. So here we are <laughs> going on San Jose. OK, here's the airport. Well, this didn't seem that useful to me still, right? Because there's the airport. I can find the airport already. If you click on this, I get this big window. OK, it's the airport and some ads. So I was still confused as the weeks went by. Why is this thing at the top of our most popular API sites? Why are millions of people viewing this thing every day? And eventually what I realized is all of this user-created content is just growing and growing and growing. And for example, uh, I took a trip to Japan last December.
There we go. And what I can do is somewhere in here I can choose language, right? So I can say I only want English. And then I can zoom in on Japan. And I can also look at somewhere maybe outside of Tokyo, somewhere rural. And there aren't going to be quite the same high quality of maps available, of paper maps. But anyone can go and add anything. And so I can zoom in. You know, here's the middle of some mountain. And what do I have? OK. I don't read Chinese. But the point is, people are adding all this content all over the world. Yeah. OK, thank you. <laughs> I saw a CN there. People are adding all of this content all over the world. And it's, it's a way to communicate. So if I go back to the list of these four, there's kind of a progression as you go down this page. The one at the top was kind of your classic API site. There's some data. Someone owns that data, has good access to that data, can present it in a useful way. And they put it on a map. And it's useful to millions of users. Now, as you move down this list of these four examples, all the way down to Wikimapia, you get a case where it's entirely user-generated content. And you can go anywhere in the world and see what any other user has written. So I think that's kind of a trend we're seeing in API sites now. It's becoming more collaborative between users. So let's jump into writing API sites yourself. Here's the code for a basic page. And I'll make it one size bigger here although I'm cutting off the word map. I'd like to try to make this a little bit of an interactive presentation. So I'd like someone here who knows some HTML to volunteer and tell me what's going on up here with this script. Yeah, it's loading JavaScript. Yeah, it loads JavaScript. It logs you in with the key. So there are a few things I should point out about this. You're including JavaScript from maps.google.com. So you're loading our basic maps API package. And that's what file API says. It says you're loading the API package. Now, you mentioned key. Before you make your own website, you have to register for a key. And that's used to authenticate your site. Now, we used to have a limit for the number of views you could have for your site per day. And now we've even made it unlimited. However, we ask if you're going to have more than about half a million, you should contact us in advance to make sure we have server capacity. Because I don't know how you do it, but if you make a site tonight that has 5 million users, I'll be very surprised in the morning. Now, I should also mention v equals 2. What's going on with v equals 2? Is anyone here secretly an advanced Maps API user? Yes? Oh, is it? No, it, it um, was an important change in the API. And we definitely needed to make the change. Yeah, so the response was it was a big change in the API. Everyone had to upgrade. We gave everyone about half a year to upgrade to a faster system. And that's version 2. It was released a little over a year ago. Now, there are a few details I can tell you. Instead of just writing version 2, you have a few options. Version 2 will give you the latest recent release from a few weeks ago. Now, actually, behind the scenes, we're incrementing our version number. So this week, maybe we're at 2.81. In a few weeks, we'll go up to 2.82, 2.83, so on as you'd expect. Now, so I said right now we're at 2.81. Maybe that's what you get with v equals 2. If you put 2.x, you're saying, give me the alpha, bleeding edge, most recent, fresh off the keyboard version. And we have developers who like to do that so they know what's coming. We even have developers 
who read our code, you know, the moment it's released, before it even goes public, they know where to look for it, and they scan through it, they find all the changes, they publish you know, blogs about the changes, they point out our bugs. Sometimes we fix the bugs before we go to the official release. So that's some of our connection where we try to make this available to you as the developers. We also have a 2.s. I don't think this has been publicized very much, but this is for mainly for our enterprise customers, but you can use it too. This is a, what we call a stable version that we're going to increment at a slower rate. So if you save V equals 2, you still get an update every two weeks. Now, if you're running you know, a huge site with millions of users and you're making a lot of money off it, you may not want to be surprised. But you may still want to get the upgrades. So 2.s is a more stable release. It might be a few months behind, but we're pretty sure it's solid and there are no bugs. And of course, the last thing is you can specify an exact version number. For some reason, maybe you really love version 2.68. And so you just keep version 2.68 forever, you know, until we deprecate it or turn it off. I think it should be good for, well, I can't make any promises, but you know, we've had version 2 live for over a year now, going on a year and a half. Now, I can tell you a story of how this works. Uh, so here's a map up at the top. And you notice the cursor over here is a hand. And the reason it became a hand was actually from a usability study we did about a year ago, where we had people come in off the street, use Google Maps, and you know, we watched them and took notes on how they used it. And to our dismay, we found that many kind of naive computer users would come in here, and they're used to other mapping sites that don't have this smooth navigation. And they never even learn to drag the map. Right? And we're tearing our hair out about this, because the fact that you can drag the map was one of our first really fantastic features that we were so proud of, right? You used to have a single image, you click left, you wait, it reloads, okay, now you're shifted to the left. You click up, you wait, now you're up. But the big feature of Google Maps when it first launched was you can grab it, you can drag it over here, it just, it loads dynamically. So we're saying, how can these users not even find our favorite core feature of the whole application? So I was given a little task to change the cursor to a hand instead of a mouse pointer. You know, we used to have this standard mouse pointer, then we changed to a hand. I think that was maybe around release 2.51. So 2.50, you have the pointer. 2.51, the hand comes out. And of course, whenever we change anything that people are used to using, we get a flood of email complaining. You know, I, I have a site where I deal with exact pixel locations. I need to exactly specify you know, the latitude, longitude, the highest precision available. And now you gave me this huge blurry hand cursor. I can't tell where the focus is. So there were two solutions here. The first solution was, OK, I went back to the code and added you know, options where users can set the cursor themselves to anything they like, or you know, set it back to the pointer, whatever. However, you know, that came out in 2.52. So that's going to be two weeks later. But there's an even faster solution these people could use instantly, which is they can just write v equals 2.5, sorry, 2.50. And then they're going to be using the old pointer. Right? And they can stay on 2.50 as long as they like. So that's an example of how we have kind of infinite backward compatibility. One thing I should mention about the key before we go on. I said a key is registered for your specific website. We have a few restrictions in addition to having to register. For the public API, it's completely free, but your site also has to be freely available to the public. That means if you're running Maps API, I have to be able to walk in to any computer with internet and open up your site. It's still possible that your site is used for commercial purposes. Right? You can run a bank. You can offer a service. Uh, you can have other features on the map that people find locations and then pay you, like the real estate site I showed. But your basic API site has to be open to the public. That's part of the restriction. If you don't want that restriction, you want to use this for some internal 
uh, behind a firewall kind of application, then you need to go for a Google Maps API enterprise. And in enterprise, basically, you get your own custom contract that allows you to use it within a, a corporate firewall. And you also get support from the Google team. So we looked at the script at the top of this example. Let me ask someone else, what's going on here with this function? Let me get a volunteer from the audience to take a wild guess at what this code is doing. Sorry, yes? Yeah, specifies the base map, specifies the location you're starting with. That's right. So this document get element by ID map, that's JavaScript for find me the element on the page named map with the ID map. And you're exactly right. This is the starting location, latitude 37, longitude minus 122. What's the 14? Zoom, exactly. All right, we have some secret advanced users hiding in the crowd. So if I run this, this is all the code you need to get a basic map going on your page. Let's look at some more examples here. So we already saw on the previous example, set center, new lat long. Now we have something different here. What's going to happen with this? extra code I've highlighted at the bottom. Yes, in the back. Uh, the yeah, after two seconds, it's going to change to a different latitude longitude. And specifically, this word pan2, let's see what that does. Did you catch that? One more time. So that first set the center to this lat long, and then a pan is a smooth motion over to this new point. And you're exactly right. The 2,000 is millisecond, so that's two seconds total. Just to show you, if I change that to a 48, let's see what happens now. It jumped. The reason it jumped is pan 2 will attempt to pan but not more than about the size of the map. It's not going to pan all the way across the continent, <coughs> just to keep it you know, within half a second of panning, something like that. Now here we have two examples of add control. So a control is what we call any of the gadgets that usually hang out on the map. So let me run those two. And you can see this one in the top left. That was the uh, small map control. Small map control has the direction arrows for moving by clicking. It also has a plus and a minus to zoom in and out. Here's map type control. And that's for choosing between these three types, map, satellite, or hybrid is both. And here's a list of a few more common controls you might find. For example, I can make this large map control. And well, OK, now I have both on top of each other. But you can see what's going on. The large map control has this full zoom slider that lets you drag all the way out to the whole world. Let me have a volunteer take another wild guess at what's going on in this code. Yes? Yeah, that's, that's very good. Uh, something about at the end of movement, 
it will pop up a dialog box with the coordinates of the center. Let's see how it runs. If I move the map here, and when I let go, I have the coordinates. And notice it's not happening again. It only happened once. Why is it only happening once? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I heard a bunch of people shouting out there. It's this remove listener. So this is a little bit twisted JavaScript. If there's such thing as non-twisted JavaScript, then this would be twisted JavaScript. Listener is a handle you get for listening to an event. The move end event is at the end of some motion. Anything that causes the map to move will fire a move end event. This is the pop-up, the alert. And then immediately after the pop-up, remove listener. That means the listener will never trigger again. Sorry, question. Yes? Okay. All right, now we have, sorry, I have a question in the front, yes. What I'm displaying right now? Yes. Yeah, this is the website I had listed on the very first page at the bottom there. Yeah, if you want to write it down or follow along, the site is http doug.rickett.com slash gdd2007. All right, page six. This one, we have a latitude longitude point. We set the map to be centered at that point at zoom level 12. And then open info window HTML. The info window is our name for what people like to call the bubble, the balloon, the pop up. We lovingly call it the info window. So here's setting the map to this point. And I can put any HTML I want inside the info window. <coughs> now let's look at markers. How about, I'll do the, ha the first half of this example, and I'll ask someone to explain the second half. So clear overlays is going to clear anything that's currently on the map. Here's a new point, a new latitude, longitude. Opt, this is a list of options for some function call I'm about to make. Title, Golden Pavilion Temple, Kyoto. Now someone take a guess at what these last three lines are going to do. And just raise your hand and we'll have one person. Yes, on the left. It's going to go to what you set. Uh, it's setting up a new marker at variable player, which is the next up. And once the latitude, and you're going to have the option of it for Golden Pavilion Temple. Uh, yes. And So what will I see on the map? One point of where the people are first going to be at. Yeah, and specifically, that's exactly correct. It will center at the where location, and it will display a marker. A marker, uh, the reason I wanted to point it out is, you know, I look at a marker every day of my life for the last year. But if you don't know, when we say marker, we mean this red kind of balloon. And that's the reason I try to be specific and call this a marker and call the info window an info window, because some people like to call them both balloons, because they're both round. So here's a marker. 
and the title option is the same as title in HTML, which means when you mouse over it and hover, you'll get a tooltip. So there's the tooltip. 17. That's just a zoom level. If I change it to uh, 19, I'll be zoomed even farther in. Yeah. I mean, here's 19. Let's go out to 12. So it's just, it's kind of like a Z coordinate. It's like the same as what you would use for altitude in Google Earth to zoom farther out. Question. Yes? Yeah, the question is, a marker is one kind of overlay. Do we have more overlays? And the answer is yes. <laughs> we have a handful of overlays that we provide you. And I, I, I think I can see where your question comes from. Here I said, clear overlays. And then I'm saying, add overlay marker. So that kind of gives you the idea. A marker is one example of an overlay. I'll show you another example of an overlay later. Uh, we have what we call polylines is a line with many points, or polygons, where we have image overlays. An overlay is basically anything you can put on the map. And if you read our documentation, it even tells you the interface you have to implement to create your own custom overlay, which is really just a few functions. Uh, I believe an initialize, a remove, maybe a copy. Basically, any HTML, you can turn it into an overlay that stays on the map. So we, the question is, are we planning to add many more overlays? And I would say we have right now a few overlays that are available by default. We allow you to create your own overlays if you want to create custom overlays. And we also have online forums where people share their code. So maybe someone has written a lovely uh, triangle overlay, and you can just copy their code and use it. But I don't expect us to add you know, 20 more overlays into the core library, because anything we add to the core library increases the size of that download. And right now, we like to keep it at you know, maybe 100K, 200K, something like that. More questions? How do you add multiple markers? How do you add multiple markers? You'll see that in the next slide. All right, next question. Info window, info window. it's in a coming slide. <laughs> <laughs> next question. So you're asking, how do you know what zoom level to go to? OK, the question is, how do you know how far you can zoom in at a particular location? Uh, basically, you have access to whatever we have available on Google Maps. So I believe, I, I could be wrong, but I think we're in the area of 22 zoom levels. Zero is the whole world. Let's take a look. It's not uniform across the whole world. So you have to know a little bit about where you're going. We have a certain level of coverage that's uniform across the whole world. And in some areas, we have extra high resolution. And there's really no way you can know right now unless you try. No, I'm sorry there's not. But let's take a look. So there's, there's zero, and here's, let's go to 20. So you can see 20, I'm on hybrid mode. We don't have any imagery. But on map mode, we do have a map at zoom level 20. Yes, in the back. The question is, what's the maximum, what's the level that's available everywhere? I believe it's 18, but don't quote me on that. Check the documentation. Next question in the front. Uh, where is the maps are not available at a closer level? Can a person provide their own child on a worldwide level? OK, the question is, when maps are not available, can people provide their own tiles? Yes, and I have a slide later that shows you how to provide your own tiles. All right, let me continue moving through the slides here, because a lot of the questions are addressed, so I want to make sure I get through these. 
We have, I'll try to save time for Q&A at the end, and we also have uh, a developer discussion forum later this afternoon. So this example, you saw previously how to make a marker. This is putting 20 markers on the page using a for loop, and it's also using a different icon. And you can use any image on the web that you want, any URL. So for example, <laughs> I happen to have a, an image. <laughs> and there I am. Right? So I can use any image on the web as an icon to put on the map. Yeah, the question is, is there a performance effect based on the number of markers? Yes. Uh, you can experiment with it yourself. On Firefox, I would recommend up to maybe 200 markers before you start seeing decreased performance. On IE, maybe 100. But just experiment yourself. Let's see if I add a whole lot here. Still doing pretty well. Marker animation. Let me have someone take a guess at what happens with this event listener for the mouse over event. Just raise your hand. Yeah, it's in the back. When you go over the marker, it will move. It will move the marker to a random place. Let's see. There's the marker. And it jumps. <laughs> Hours of entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> now what I'm doing now, I'm clicking run a few dozen times. Right. All of these markers are now jumping whenever I mouse over. And my point with these examples is not to give you an exhaustive tour of all of Google Maps API, but to give you a flavor for how a few lines of JavaScript can be used to accomplish some useful actions. We had a question about using markers and info windows together. So in this example, I create a marker, and I'm adding an event listener to the click event on the marker object. And then I'm calling marker open info window HTML. So it's going to behave pretty much as you'd expect. I click on the marker, I get an info window. And this is all functionality that's part of Google Maps, the main website, and we expose it in the API. We had a question about other types of overlays, and I mentioned polylines. So here, I have a list of four latitude longitude points. And I just put them in an array and add overlay new G polyline points. So it's about as straightforward as you could expect. Asynchronous HTTP. This is where it starts getting interesting, in my opinion. Uh, you can have static data encoded in your JavaScript file. You know, just an array of data. However, it starts getting more complicated if you separate the data from the code. And that's usually a good thing to do because your data could come from a dynamic source while your code stays static. So in this example, we have the utility function download URL. You pass it a URL here, data.xml. It's going to load that file, and here, there's a for loop that goes through everything in that file and creates markers. So here you see four markers on the map. And I'll open the data file for you. And there's your data in XML. You know, pretty straightforward. Four lines, latitude, longitude.
pardon me there. And each of those lines of data was turned into a marker. Question in the front. In, in the code, uh, I could show different things to different people. Would that be violating the terms of the agreement? You could show different things to different people in the code. Uh, no, that doesn't violate the terms of the agreement. You have to, if I understand the legal contract correctly, and I don't want to say I'm an authority on that, the website has to be available to the public. If you ask about maybe you have to register for a free login, I think that's a gray area and I'd have to read the fine print. But what if the public saw a general map but you had to, you had to be logged in to get other, stu other stuff on the map? I'd have to check the terms of use. Yeah, question. So if I understand correctly, you're asking about you know, how difficult it is to parse a lot of XML. Is that right? Yeah, like the performance of that library call on bottom browser or bottom browser right now. Yeah, so if you have a huge amount of XML and it's detailed and complicated, and you're going to parse it client-side in JavaScript, you could have a performance hit. I'll show you in one more slide. Uh, we have a utility function, actually, that helps you with that. Yes, question? The question is, do we have import and export for Esri shapefiles or something like that? We don't have that built in. I'll show you in another slide uh, what we do support. Actually, uh, here's an example of custom controls. And controls, as I mentioned, are things like the zoom in and out buttons. And in this one, you have to implement a few functions yourself. So here's the initialize function that takes the map object and adds something to the map. Now, a control is different from an overlay in that a control stays in the same place as you move the map. This uh, control is just a white rectangle. And the only real thing it does is right here. It handles the click event, and it calls remove control. So let's see that in action. There it goes. You can imagine making more advanced controls yourself, <laughs> even before I finish my presentation. Sorry, I realized. You asked about, uh, there were a couple questions about parsing XML and reading Esri. And that's actually going to be in the advanced API section this afternoon. Now here is the geocoder. <coughs> Since we're almost done, I want to ring a few more questions, or rather answers, out of the audience. So someone take a guess at what's going on with this code. <coughs> yeah, in the front. It's just translating that address into a map element and plotting that point on the map. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's translating an address into a latitude longitude and plotting that on the map. So the technical term we use for that is geocoding. And the geocoder here is a JavaScript object that we provide you in the API so you can do your own geocoding. So I ran this code. It took this text string, Avenue Gustav Eiffel, Paris. It converted it into a latitude longitude point, and then new G marker. 
putting a marker on the map. Now, what do you think will happen if I type some garbage in here? It could go to Paris or? Google will try to read your mind and try to make the best guess. It could make a best guess. It could still end up in Paris because it has the word Paris. Sorry? Goes to Mountain View. Goes to Mountain View. <laughs> Those are all possible answers. And I think the real answer is none of the above. Uh, you get back no point here. Let's see how you can check for that. So I'm adding an alert statement if no point was returned. And there it is. The question was, is it null? My guess is yes followed by possibly undefined. <laughs> null is the winner. So you get back null if nothing was found. And again, you can consult all the documentation for all the details of each of these calls. Can you get more than one point? Can you get more than one point? Uh, I believe you only get back one point with this call. However, I should refer you to all the documentation, which is listed right at this website, which has full detail about every function call. Sorry? What's the geocode for Earth? For Earth. What's the geocode for Earth? I don't think Earth geocodes, unfortunately. <laughs> so I want to save a few minutes for any question and answer about any part of the Maps API. And before you leave, I want to make sure you know about this website here, google.com APIs Maps. That will get you there. If you add documentation, you'll skip the welcome screen. Uh, so question in the front. Yeah, the question is, can you print, or will we add the ability to print satellite views? Uh, we don't have that right now. We're always working on improving the features as fast as we can. So I can't guarantee you a timetable, but it's something we're aware of and we'd like to improve printing. Are you talking about printing maps off of a web page or yeah, printing it some other way? Uh, yeah. You can actually print, uh, if you don't actually click on print button, if you just click print, I don't know if you're weaponizing it, but I might drive the situation away from that. Yeah, so Yathan here, who's another Google employee, is telling you there are a few different ways. Uh, you can hit print from the browser instead of, we have a special print link, and our special print link is usually trying to help you overcome browser incompatibilities. For example, maybe you can print in IE, but you can't print in Firefox, that kind of thing. But let me keep this uh, focused on Maps API. Uh, yes, question by the aisle. Do we have a routing API? Yes, come to the advanced session this afternoon. Uh, question by the wall. Yeah, is there a way to highlight a marker? Is there a way to highlight a marker? Yes, and I skipped that slide because we were short on time. Let me go through it really quickly. Marker image. We have a function set image, and when you mouse over, this marker is turning yellow. How do we find that marker? Uh, you can read this code here. It has a mouse over right. handler. So it's about mouse and over, like can you identify a marker and say highlight that one? Yeah, the question is can you highlight the marker without the user having to mouse over? Anything you can get to in JavaScript. You can call marker set image to a yellow marker. So you can change the color any way you can get to it in JavaScript. Uh, yes, question in the wall, so by the wall. Do you get the geocoder to return uh, the map quality score and have that help us make our score and make it work? The question is can you get the geocoder to return the quality of the geocode? I think it will just return null right now. However, check the documentation if we have any additional utilities for you. Uh, yes, right here. Um, 
So the question is, can you display a title for a marker where you don't have to mouse over, but it just shows up on the map? Uh, so markers use an image. There are other overlays. There's actually a, an open source uh, publicly created, not by Google, but by a third party overlay called text marker. I think that's exactly what you'd use. It would be like a marker, but you give it a text string. Or you can create your own, probably in about 20 or 30 lines of JavaScript. Question in the front. I, I saw Flash embedded in a, uh, one of those info windows. Mm -hmm. Is that straightforward, or is it kind of difficult to do? So the question is, there is Flash embedded in an info window somewhere. And you can put any HTML in an info window. So you can, input, you can put the HTML to embed a Flash object in your info window. Yes. How about one more question, and we'll wrap up. Yes? So the question is, you want to display raster data on the map, like a bitmap or something. And again, I think I have a couple different examples of this in the advanced session this afternoon. We have a method that allows you to take an image, just a single image, and put it down on the map anywhere you want. And then you could put overlays on top of that, too. Or we have an API where you can specify tiles, a whole set of tiles for different zoom levels. And you can show bitmaps of different tiles. So with that, let me wrap up this session. And thank you all for coming. And I want to say, go forth and create mashups. I hope you've enjoyed this, and thank you very much.